One of the most unique features of the Amstrad CPC-464 is the built-in tape deck, which sounds really convenient until you realize it has no audio in jack to use a different source. Today I'm going to do some digging to find the best way to add an audio in connector and I'll even try to answer one of my long-standing questions about this computer. Hello and welcome back to Noah's Retro Lab. This is the Amstrad CPC-464 that Patreon supporter Leo Albonisi had sent me from the UK. A few episodes ago I serviced it and gave it a good clean, but since it's now going back to Leo in the US and he doesn't have any easy access to Amstrad tapes in there, it's pretty limited when it comes to options for playing games. Sure, you can always use one of those tape adapters that you see sometimes in cars, but that's not very elegant or even very reliable. So instead, let's make a small mod to be able to feed audio data directly into the computer and check that we're doing it in the best possible way. We'll try several ways to load data later on, but since my favorite way is to use a dedicated device like the TZX Duino, let's go ahead and build one so I can send it to Leo along with the computer. TCX Duino Reloaded is a board designed by Edu Arana that, with the help of an Arduino microcontroller, generates the audio data to load software from files like TCX and CDT. TCX Duino Reloaded is an open source project and you can find the link to the project page in the description. Last time I built a TCX Duino, I ran into some problems with the design, but there's now an updated version that fixes all those things. Some people ask me for a tutorial on how to build your own PCBs for an existing project. There really isn't much to it, and I usually show most of it in my videos, I just fast forward through it. But let's go ahead and talk through every step. The first thing you need to do is download the Gerber files. Usually you want to download them all zipped up like they're here in the GitHub repository. Then go to your favorite PCB manufacturer. I'm going to use PCBWay because they are this episode's generous sponsors, but I would actually use them even if they weren't. I love that you can just go to their webpage, click on instant quote, click quick order PCB and upload the Gerber file and that's almost everything you need to do. Once you do that, you can even see a render of what the PCB looks like. The most important thing is to select how many PCBs you want made. You have to order a minimum of five, which is usually good for things like this and to have some spares or share them with your retro friends. You can change some of the parameters, but if you're starting out, you can usually just leave them as they are. And yes, you can always tweak the colors. In this case, I'm just going to leave everything as a default and go for it. So add it to the cart, select your shipping option, and boom, they are on their way. While you're waiting for the PCBs, you can head over to the bill of materials on the project page and make sure you have them all, or place an order for the ones you don't have, so that way you get all your materials together. And after a few days, here it is. Very nicely packaged, all five PCBs. So let's open it up. There you go. Beautiful. Thank you to Edu, the designer of TZX Duino. He actually included me in the credits right there. So now I have my name in this PCB, which is great. Before I start with the soldering, and this is just my particular preference, I like to print out the bill of materials and check off every item as I put it on the workbench. That way I won't run into any surprises in the middle of assembling it, which is rather annoying. You'd be surprised how many times I've done this just to find out I don't have a component I thought I did or that I even ordered the wrong size somehow. One tip, when dealing with SMD components, especially capacitors, once you remove them from their packaging strip, it's really hard to tell them apart. So if there are any doubts, I will often tape them to the sheet at the right place so I don't get them confused. And since it looks like we have all the components, let's do a 20 second build montage. That's all the SMD components and it's looking great. So time to change the tip and move on to the through hole components. And last little detail, the protection of the LCD screen. With the TZX Duino assembled, now we need to program it. We'll use the Max Duino firmware, which is what actually instructs the Arduino to generate the right tones based on the file data. As a plus, 
Since this is the Arduino Nano, we can program it directly using a USB cable instead of one of those USB to serial adapters that seem not to work half the time. Since it's also an open source project, we can download it, build it, and upload it to the Arduino as usual. And let's see if the programming of the Arduino worked correctly. I'm going to power it on by connecting the USB. And if so, we should see some message right here. Oh, there we go. We, there we go. Perfect. No SD card. So it looks like the programming was correct. So let's try putting in an SD card and playing back some game. I'm going to use this external speaker just to see if we hear the sound of the game data. Whoa, that was loud. That was really loud. That sounds just right. We have the TZX Duino working correctly, so now it's the moment of truth. How exactly should we hook it up to the Amstrad? If you search online, you'll find this mod described, but the connection point varies quite a bit from description to description. Does it matter? Is there a correct way of doing it? Let's look at the Amstrad and see if we can reason it out. Just looking at the PCB on the Amstrad tape deck is a bit hard to make sense out of things, but as soon as we pull the schematics for the board, things become a lot more clear. There are multiple parts to this diagram. The top row involves the amplification of the computer audio and the speaker to play that audio. We don't care about that part from now, but keep in mind that it's there because we'll come back to it towards the end of this video. The bottom part involves the audio being sent from the computer to be written to the tape. We're also going to ignore that for now. That area we're left with in the middle is exactly what we're looking for. Those are the stages the tape deck signal goes through. The first stage is the generation of that signal at the head due to the magnetic patterns in the cassette tape. The signal at that point is there, but it's very small. In order for the computer to use it, we need to amplify it. The first stage of amplification is the transistor Q301. I'm not sure how much of a gain it is exactly, but probably not a huge amount. It's still unusable by the computer at this point. Then the signal moves to the first op amp or operational amplifier. This is an inverting op amp configuration and it inverts the signal, but it amplifies it a huge amount. At that point, the computer could hear the signal, but it's not shaped quite right. Ideally, we want a purely square wave with fast transitions from zero to one and back to zero. To accomplish this, we have the second and last op amp stage. This is set up as an inverting comparator with hysteresis, so it pretty much outputs either 0 volts or 5 volts depending on which of the input is higher. In other words, that transforms our previous signal into an ideal square wave. And beyond that, the signal is sent to the Amstrad PCB through the cassette connector, and from there is sent directly to the PPI without any buffering or anything, so it can be read directly by the Amstrad. And now that we know exactly how the cassette signal is being processed, where should we connect our audio in then? The TCX Duino already generates a square wave signal that goes from 0 volts to 5 volts, so it would be tempting to connect it at the end of the second op amp stage. That might work, but I was concerned about the feedback into the op amp and whether the op amp output would fight the Arduino one. And since there are no resistors to separate the two, I thought it might be better to look for another point. Besides, as we'll see later, we may want to connect an audio source that is not fully amplified yet. The input of the second op amp would have similar problems to the first one, and besides, this is an inverting one, so we would get an inverted signal, so I think the best point would be the input of the first op amp. That gives us a good point without any weird feedback, and we get some amplification. But enough theory. Let's implement the mod and see how it works. So the actual mod itself is very simple. Here I have an audio jack and has a ground cable and a signal cable. So the ground cable, I'll just connect to ground somewhere in here because it's close to where the jack is going to be in the case. And this one, as we saw, we want to connect it to the input of the first op amp. And so the typical place for that is right here in this leg of capacitor 316. And you can even tell that this was um, modified before. So clearly the previous owner had some kind of um, input mod right there. And so we'll just do that. As you can see, it doesn't get much easier than that. There we go. That was it. So before we attach it to the case or anything like that, let's just make sure that it actually works. So for now, I just have the cable coming out through there. It doesn't matter, that's just temporary for testing. So now we can just say run, press a key, and we'll have to, we don't have to press play or anything. We can just 
select what we want here. So Batman, that sounds good. And there we go. It's playing already. You can hear it. You can hear it actually pretty loudly, which makes sense because the signal was coming really loud and clear. Okay, it picks it up, the first block. So this is looking great. It just worked right off the bat. Yeah, and look at that. It's loading the screen just fine. It's not going any faster than usual. This is not trying to go any faster yet. <laughs> but this is at least should be very, very reliable. So let's just wait and see if he loads the whole thing. Okay, we finished loading the screen. And now it starts with the data of the game itself. Okay, this is looking great. And looking at the Arduino, it looks like we're 32%, 33% in. So that's also nice to know. Awesome. There you go. It loaded perfectly fine. Let's see, you had the volume down. Hmm. This is weird. We're not getting any sound. This should be playing music right now. So I ran a couple tests, and this is kind of weird. So I have the TZX Duino connected through the audio cable, but not plugged in. And I can crank up the volume of the Amstrad to the maximum, and I press delete, and we hear a loud beep. But as soon as I power the TZX Duino, now we get nothing, nothing at all. And if I unplug this, then we get it again, I plug it back in, we get nothing. So something is not connected correctly. So I realized this is not connected where I meant to connect it. I wouldn't stray for that because I noticed that that solder joint in particular was used before. And I seem to recall that this is what was listed in CPC Wiki. And that is what is listed. And I had seen that it says capacitor 316, which is where I had identified that I wanted to put it. However, this is not capacitor 316. This is over here. So I meant to connect it here, not here. This turns out is connected to pin seven. This is the output of the first op amp and the input of the second op amp. And I did not want to connect it there because I was afraid of what it was going to do to the sort of the feedback loop on that op amp. I wanted to put it at the input, not at the output. It's very interesting that it's suppressing the sound when I'm assuming this signal goes to ground is preventing the sound from being heard on the CPC. And that's something we're going to go in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. But first, let's fix it and let's do it the right way. It should be really simple. It should be a matter of taking it from here and putting it there. That's it. Okay, let's try it again. This is connected the correct way, at least I think so, the way I meant to connect it at the beginning. So we have sound, and now I'll connect the USB cable. Wait until it initializes, okay. And we still have sound. Okay, now let's see if this works. <laughs> That's the other one. So let's try loading something. Batman, okay. Okay, I'm hearing it. And there we go. Okay, so yeah, I think this is the better way to connect it. Let's see if we get the music now. Okay, yes, loud and clear. I need to turn it down. Okay, yeah, so this is definitely the correct way to hook it up. So now we get to the part of how to put this in a permanent way on the case. And if you remember from a previous episode, we already had a jack in here, except that this was a power jack, not an audio jack. So one option is to reuse this, but I find this so dangerous to have two power jacks that it's so easy to accidentally connect the five volts in there that I really don't want to do that. I think I probably should try to take this out and uh, see if we can connect this in the same hole. So this one looks to have some epoxy or something there, and it's really well, really well glued in place. So I don't know. So I think it also has a nut like this one. And maybe it just comes, I can unscrew it. Yeah, it's coming off. Now the ideal thing would be if somehow the washer was the same size, wouldn't that be something? You know, it might be, it might be the same. 
is this really going to fit? That would be ideal. I think it just did. <laughs> wow. That was lucky. There it is, all connected. So maybe I should run this and tuck it under this cable so they're a little bit more out of the way like that. Okay, let's try this. Check it out, that's perfect. It fits really nicely with the rest of the case. I'm glad we didn't even have to punch a hole. That hole was already punched. It's not a power jack, so there's no confusion. So let's see how it fits. Great. There's one more thing that we need to do that I was kind of hesitating getting into it because I don't have the right piece with me. But if you're gonna be using the TZX Duino a lot with the Amstrad, you really should connect the remote control. That's what allows the Amstrad to control whether there is the playback is happening or not. Normally they would control the motor and uh, of, the, of, the, of the cassette tape. And in this case, we wanted to control the TZX Duino. And for that, we have even a jack in here. So what I don't have is I don't have a, a 2.5 millimeter jack like this one. And I don't wanna make another similar one, another hole like this one, and then be confusing which one is which. It's pretty standard that the remote control is a smaller one, so really that's the correct way of doing it. Just for testing purposes, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hook up a cable directly here, and then maybe I'll leave it tucked in in here, or if I get the pieces later, I'll, I'll make the, the hole. But for now, at least we can test it. And it's actually really easy. One of them goes to ground, so just like the other one right there. And the other one needs to go to the signal that tells the motor to play. And that's this cable. It's like the further, furthest most cable in the controller. And that's that. We'll just leave it dangling like this. Now we're going to load a game that actually I know from experience that if it doesn't have the remote control cable, it will not load properly. There's probably some kind of protection scheme or something that checks that the timings are correct. And it will pause the, um, the, the cassette for just a few seconds. And that game is Renegade. So let's go ahead. And if we start it, it shouldn't start. There we go. It says paused because the Amstrad is still not giving the signal to the cassette to start. For that, we need to, to run and press the key, and then we'll hear the relay, and the signal will go there. There we go. Hear the click, and boom, that starts right away. Oh, and this is a perfect example. It paused the play, the playback, waiting for the user to press the key, and we can press it, and it continues loading. So yeah, it's working great. And there you go, it loaded correctly. That's great. Everything was working great with the TCX Duino and I was getting ready to wrap things up. And just before that, I decided to try loading some audio files directly from an iPad. I figured there wouldn't be an issue with that, but it turns out I was quite wrong. Okay, there we go. No, it recognized it, but not enough to detect the end of the block or anything like that. And you can even tell if you're very used to the Amstrad loading sounds, that doesn't sound quite right. We've already seen what the signal waveforms are like for data that we read from cassette. Let's have a look now at what the signals look like when we get in from the TCX Duino. This is the signal we're feeding it at the start of op amp one. It's already nice and square as we expected. This is the start of op amp 2, and it looks pretty much the same. And this is the output of op amp 2. So as we expected, it didn't change very much at all, and it remained a nice square signal throughout. Now let's look at the data as it comes from the iPad. This is the signal as it comes out of the iPad. That is really different from the TCX Duino signal. Let's put them side by side for a second. There are multiple differences. One big difference is how noisy it looks. The iPad is playing back a recording of the audio data in a high frequency lossless format. At first, I was really surprised about those ripples because it looks like textbook approximation of a square wave with sine waves typical of a Fourier transform. And I thought maybe modern devices were applying all sorts of unwanted filters to the audio output, but it turns out this is just an artifact of trying to play back a square wave signal with a modern sound card, since it pretty much needs to reconstruct it from samples. So we're just gonna have to live with that. But that's not everything. There's still another big difference. 
The TZ Arduino signal was varying between 0 and 5 volts, but this one is centered around 0 volts. We also know the cassette tape signal had a positive bias, so that could be a problem. Let's move on to the next stage. At the output of op amp 1, it looks like this. It seems mostly like a well-behaved square wave, so maybe there was nothing wrong with it. And this is what the output of op amp 2 looks like. No wonder the Amstrad can read the data. I'm even surprised it was even able to process the header with a file name. What happened here? So let's go back to the second stage. If you look closely, you'll see that those aren't nice square waves after all. There seem to be a lot of spikes in the leading edge. I suspect that might have something to do with the way the op amp amplifier is set up and not expecting negative voltages, so it has some initial feedback until it settles into the square wave. And I also suspect those edges are what's completely throwing off the second op amp stage, especially since it's not a plain comparator, but it has hysteresis built in, so it probably latches onto one of those spikes incorrectly and holds the voltage low when it should be at the top of the square wave. What a mess! Since the problem might very well be the offset of the signal, the way to solve that would be to add a capacitor between the signal and the board where we receive that. So I could actually add a capacitor there without too much trouble or maybe add the connector. But looking at the schematics, I noticed that there is capacitor 317 that is in between the initial transistor and stage one of the op amp. So I'm going to try moving it right there as a first pass. So that should be on this side of 317. And let's try to see if A, the signal is biased correctly, and B, whether it actually loads correctly or not. This is from the iPad again. Yes, it's biased correctly. That's great. And the input to the second one. Oh, yeah, look at that. That one is great. Oh, and the computer detected it. So, yeah, it's loading. This is awesome. So that might make it possible to connect other devices that are biased differently, like the iPad or a laptop or um, smartphone, things like that. So yeah, I think that might be the best place to connect the audio input. And finally, I decided to use this as an opportunity to try to dig deeper into one of the mysteries of the Amstrad CPC. A small unanswered question, at least to me, about the Amstrad is, how exactly are we hearing the cassette loading sound through the regular speaker? Other computers, like the MSX, make no sound whatsoever as they're loading from cassette. That's why some of the external tape players designed for MSX have a monitor button that plays the data sound on the player's speaker. But the Amstrad CPC clearly plays the audio data through the internal speaker. So how exactly is this sound played on the speaker? Remember our tape deck PCB diagram from earlier? There were three parts. So far, we've been focused on the middle part that processes the data read from cassette, but ignore the other one that amplifies the computer sound. Clearly, there has to be a connection from the middle part to the top part, and more specifically, to the top part before the volume control, since we can control the volume of the audio data with the volume wheel. Up until now, I had assumed that the connection was somewhere on the Amstrad board itself, but I traced the data line carefully earlier, and it just goes straight into the PPI without any splits anywhere. Okay, so the connection is somewhere on this tape PCB, right? Right, except that if you look at it closely, you won't find any connection between the top and middle parts other than VCC. This is when I found an old thread on CPC Wiki talking about this, and the latest theory put forward was that it was some crosstalk between the op amps in the same chip, and that caused the audio op amp to pick up the signal and send it to the speaker. If so, that must have been an accident, but the Amstrad engineers liked it enough to leave it in and label it as a feature. Neat story, but is it true? So let's go ahead and test that theory. So over here we have the PCB, and over here we have just the mechanical parts of the gears and the buttons and all of that. And here is our quad op amp. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this op amp to the breadboard. This should be the exact same configuration as we had before. I haven't changed anything. I've actually color coded a few things. So that's VCC and that's ground. In yellow, we have the two op amps for the tape loading. In brown, we have the op amp for the sound amplification. So I'm going to try to play this now. So listen. Okay, we're going to still hear the sound. And now I've split it into two different chips. So on the top, we have just the computer audio op amp. 
And on the bottom, we have the two stages of the tape deck loading op amps. So the very first thing I'm going to do is just make sure that the amp straight can make a noise. So I'm going to press the delete key. OK, that works fine. Now let's play some of the cassette. OK, we still hear it. And I see it being loaded. So it wasn't just interference between the op amps in the same package. And that's not a bad thing, because if there was that kind of interference between the op amps in the same chip, that would be a really bad quality op amp. OK, so what else can it be? Since I had the op amps already on the breadboard, I decided to continue experimenting. If I unplug the output of the first op amp of the audio amplification, you still hear the tape loading. Wow. That was unexpected, but it's not just that. You can even unplug the inputs and the output of the op amp, and you can still hear the tape. Is that crazy or what? So that narrowed down the possible connections to somewhere between the audio in connection and the volume wheel. Published circuit schematics aren't always up to date, or sometimes have mistakes or even whole parts that were left out for simplicity. I thought this could be a possibility, so I set out to find the missing connection. I poked all around looking for possible connections and nothing. I came out completely empty handed. There was no connection I could find. So I was able to advance the question a bit more. I managed to rule out some possibilities like the sound coming from the AY chip or being an op amp crosstalk, but I wasn't able to nail down exactly the mechanism that was causing the sound. And you know, that's OK. Not everything in life can be neatly wrapped up. Sometimes you just don't find the answer you're looking for. But this was not going to be one of those times. After my failure to identify how loading data propagates to the speaker, I decided to post on the CPC Wiki forums, which are probably the main hub of the Amstrad CPC. There you'll find some of the most knowledgeable people on the system. Within a few hours of me posting, user RetroCPC replied with some ideas and then quickly set out to run some experiments of their own. And just a few hours later, they had the solution. It turns out there's no explicit connection, but it's a parasitic connection between the data read track and the audio in track. Both tracks wind around the PCB and intersect in multiple places, and this is what's causing the data signal to jump over to the audio section. RetroCPC confirmed this theory by going as far as cutting some of the tracks in their own PCB and adding some wires and check how the interference was avoided this way. So thank you so much for your investigation, RetroCPC. One more mystery solved. So in the end, we were able to put a check mark next to that unanswered question after all. And of course, most importantly, Leo's Amstrad is all set up with an audio in jack that should work with just about any audio loading device. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Any comments, let me know as usual. And I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.